all of you have been in a swimming pool, I imagine all of you have, you got, the deeper you go, the more your, your ears hurt, and, and um, that's because of increases in pressure. And so we're going to address the, the actual increase in pressure in this section. Start off with a demo. This is a demonstration of how pressure increases as you go deeper and deeper into a fluid. The pressure I inside of a fluid is equal to the pressure on the surface plus the density of the fluid, rho, times g, the acceleration of gravity, times the height or the depth into which you're in the fluid. Here at the top, uh, the pressure at the surface of, of the top of this uh, fluid is atmospheric pressure, 14.7 pounds per square inch. And as you go deeper and deeper, uh, the pressure increases according to the formula that I just described. As you go down to 10 meters of depth, you get um, another atmospheric pressure added onto the atmospheric pressure you had at the surface. So you go from uh, one atmospheric pressure here, go down 10 meters, you get two atmospheres, go another 10 meters down, you get three atmospheres of pressure, et cetera. So to demonstrate the different pressures at the different uh, depths in this fluid, I have, um, I'll pull these stoppers out. Um, the, the deeper we go, the higher the pressure and the faster the velocity will come out. Okay, so we're losing fluid, but I think you can see that always the deepest one had the highest velocity and the highest pressure. Okay, now we're going to uh, actually derive the equation that I talked about in the demo, which is this equation here. The pressure at... Uh, a lower position, so down here, pressure P2 down here, pressure P1 up here, how are they related? Well, P2 would better be greater than P1, we saw it in the demo, and you're familiar with that too. And sure enough it is, P2, the lower, the pressure at the lower point in the fluid, is the pressure at the higher point plus the density of the water, or whatever liquid you're in, times the uh, difference in height between the two points, and, and then times the acceleration of gravity. Where does that come from? It comes by balancing the forces on this little volume of, of fluid bounded by these two orange squares on top and on bottom. We we have a pressure P2 down here, which according to pressure, uh, according to the definition of pressure, is the force per unit area pointing perpendicular to the surface. So the force on this surface, on this bottom surface, is the pressure times the area. The pressure is force per unit area, therefore the force is pressure times the area. That pushes up on this volume of fluid. Well, same thing up here. We got a lower pressure up here, it, and it exerts a force pointing down. So we got a force pointing down, a force pointing up. We also have the weight of the, uh, of the volume of fluid, its mass times acceleration of gravity. So if we look at um, balancing the forces in the y direction, and we say that that fluid is static, meaning it's not moving, it's in equilibrium, then we go look at all the forces and they have to be equal to zero. Uh, P2 times A points in the plus Y direction, points up. Minus P1 times A points down, so that's why it comes in with the minus sign. And then gravity points down equals zero. So solving that for P2A, we get P1A plus Mg. And we know that mass of this volume, it's a, it's a box-shaped volume, a here is the cross-sectional area. I didn't mention that until now. So that's this area here. Um, as here and here as well. 
The mass is the volume times the density. Because density is mass per unit volume, mass is uh, volume times the density. So that gives us the mass of volume times g, uh, volume times rho, and times g. And then we realize that the volume of this box shape is the height of the box times the cross-sectional area. The area times the, cro uh, times the height. Plug that in here for the volume. And we get this equation here. And lo and behold, a miracle occurs. The, uh, there's an area in all three terms. And we get P2 is P1 plus rho hg. We're going to write that rho gh. So I don't expect you to know that derivation, but I, I'm, I'm glad that you've seen it and know kind of where it comes from. It just comes from balancing the forces on a volume of fluid. No big deal. But the, the requirement is for you to understand and know this relationship. P2, the pressure at a deeper level. P equals P1, the pressure at the higher level, measured in, both measured in Pascals, um, equals the mass, uh, the P1 plus rho GH, where rho is a mass density, G is acceleration of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, and H is the height difference. Lake Mead is the largest wholly artificial reservoir in the United States. The water in the reservoir backs up behind Hoover Dam. So here's Hoover Dam. And um, for a considerable distance of 120 miles. So we're a good distance behind there. Suppose that all the water in this lake were removed except in a relatively narrow vertical column. So just get rid of all the water and put a mountain here or whatever. Just put water here. So this is what it looks like in cross-section. And you ask the question, um, would the Hoover Dam so <laughs> there's a little typo here, but would the would this same structure still be required to contain the water, or would a much less, of, m less massive structure do the job? And the short answer is yes. You still need that whole structure, even for that tiny, narrow thing. And you say, that doesn't make any, ins any sense at all to me. Because this, this dam is hold having to hold water that goes 120 miles upstream. But the answer is that the ground underneath holds each little segment of water. And this, all this dam is required to do is to, is to be strong enough to match the pressure of the water at each different depth. So up here, we only have one atmosphere of pressure that's exerted on that wall. But as we go down 10 meters, we double that to two atmospheres of pressure. Then another 10 meters, we get three uh, atmospheres. And that's independent of the size of this column. It could be one centimeter in width, and you'd still have that same amount of pressure exerted on it. It depends only on the depth. It doesn't depend on the horizontal extent. It's one of the fascinating principles, I think. Uh, an example, points A and B are located at a distance of 5.5 meters beneath the surface of the water. Find the pressure at each of these two locations. So in one case, we've got kind of a cave situation where there's an overhang. And I'm looking at the pressure of this, uh, points A and B, both at 5.5 meters. The, um, the short answer is that the pressure is going to be exactly the same. If the depths of both points are the same, the pressures are the same. Um, P2 equals P1. So the pressure at the surface is going to be atmospheric pressure, 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals, one atmosphere, plus the density of water, which is a gram per cubic centimeter or one kilogram per cubic, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times 9.8 times the depth. And that gives a pressure P2 at both of those places. Here's a demonstration that the height that water rises um, is independent of the shape of the columns, which, which uh, 
is an illustration of what we've been talking about. That it doesn't matter the horizontal extent or what it looks like, it doesn't matter. What matters is the depth. This is a demonstration of the variation of pressure with the depth of a fluid. And in particular, we're thinking about it the opposite way. How high is a column of fluid going to be, depending on the shape of the column of the fluid? So let's just do the experiment. Okay, as you can see, the height of all of these columns of water is the same. The reason is that it doesn't matter what the shape of the column is. What does matter in terms of pressure is how the pressure varies with depth. At the top of the column, here's the top on this one, the pressure of, the, of that top surface is just the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the column. As we increase the depth, go deeper and deeper, the pressure increases according to rho, the density of water, times g, the acceleration of gravity, times h, the, the depth of the, of the column. Once we get down to the bottom, pressure has to be the same everywhere along here because it's all at the same height. But, but the bottom line is that it doesn't matter what the shape of the column is. The pressure as a function of depth is always going to be the same. So you might be asking, what about the human body? Doesn't it ha isn't it a column of, of water? And the answer is, yeah, it sure is. Uh, we have blood throughout our body. Let's take a look at the Static blood pressure, static meaning with blood that's not moving. So this is for a, a person that's just died. Difference between the foot and the, uh, and the heart when a person is reclining or standing. Now the, the actual dynamic blood pressure will be a little bit different from this, but um, this would be what would happen between beats of the heart when the, the blood, blood gets pushed and slows down a little bit and then is waiting for the next beat of the heart. So uh, blood pressure, pressure P1 is at the heart, and then P2 is down at the foot. And there's a 1.35 meter uh, difference in height between the two. P2 equals P1 pl plus rho G8. So I've subtracted P1 from both sides. And this is the calculation for uh, resting situation. So the height here of the heart is the same as the height of the feet and the difference in pressure is zero. So the, they're, they're both at the same height above the ground. Uh, whereas while standing, so this is resting, reclining, and this is standing, then we do have a difference in height of 1.35 meters and that's the difference in, in pressure. So this is a demonstration that you can get different readings in blood pressure depending on how your body is, is oriented. This is a demonstration that your body is a column of water. And as you proceed from head to toe, the pressure of that column increases. And that increase is quite significant. And we can measure that by a, a, a blood pressure cuff. So what I'm going to do is measure my blood pressure in two different positions, one with my hand down at my side and the other with my hand out horizontally to show you the difference in blood pressure. Doctors use this, this fact that um, your blood pressure depends on your position. Actually, you get a different pl blood pressure if you're seated in the normal position uh, when the doctor takes your blood pressure versus lying down versus standing up get uh, different, significantly different blood pressures in each position. 
So we're going to try and get a blood pressure down here first. So you have to think about that blood coming down into my arm and, and pooling down here and creating greater pressure down near my hand than there would be up near the shoulder. One ninety three over one twenty one. A pretty alarming number if you were to get that blood pressure and you went into the doctor. Let's try it out to the side. One fifty one over eighty five. Both numbers significantly lower than they would be uh, at the lowest position, but yet significantly above their value that I would normally get. One hundred twenty over eighty is my blood pressure sitting down. In, in the usual situation. So the, the bottom line here is that we have a column of water that's our body, we get lower pressures, higher pressures as you go further, deeper and deeper into your body.